Hi everyone, uh, welcome to our first ever Alia Graphic Creator Chat. I'm Jurgi uh, and I'm the Alia Graphic Novels and Comics uh, convener. Um, this is a newly formed group within um, Alia and uh, um, basically coronavirus has changed our lives and our world, uh, at least temporarily. And uh, we're all stuck at home. Um, we thought this was a really good opportunity to uh, join the American Graphic Novels and Comics Roundtable uh, and, uh, you know, just uh, invite a few different creators, have a chat with them, and put some video content out there. We, we're also uh, looking into uh, talking to a few li librarians um, who are graphic novel champions and uh, there are libraries. And so it's just going to be a series of videos where we just have a conversation with different people about graphic novels, comics, libraries, and the things that interest us. And today we're really excited um, that for this first video, we have uh, Christian Carnouge with us. Uh, and uh, he made a graphic novel that I really, really love uh, called uh, Resurrected. Uh, and he was a writer for it. And it was an independent uh, graphic novel that I really, really enjoyed. And I really championed online when it came out. And so I'm really excited to uh, have a chat with him. So welcome, Christian. Hi, thanks so much for having me. And yeah, I really appreciate um, how much support uh, you've given the resurrected over the last sort of six months or so. Yeah. As an indie sort of publisher, you really, you know, you need a, sort of all the help you can get and you don't forget sort of who's been uh, helping you along. Yeah. Um, look, uh, uh, I think um, it, it was, uh, it was a graphic novel that uh, I think I found it on Twitter uh, just by chance. And, um, and um, when I read about it, I thought this sounds like a really, really cool story. And it really resonated with me. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I, I'm, I'm very happy to be talking with you. And we'll go back to the resurrected, um, you know, a bit later. But I think yeah. let, let's start a little bit with, with you. So you're, you're Australian. But you've been living in the Netherlands for quite a few years now, as I understand. Um, yeah. So, you know, tell us a bit about yourself, what you do, where you live. Uh, so, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm, I'm Australian. I'm from Sydney. Uh, grew up there. I, about ten and a half years ago, I moved uh, to The Hague in the Netherlands uh, to work for the United Nations. Uh, so, I'm basically just a public servant. Uh, I only planned to come here for about a year and then sort of I had a job in, uh, I had a job in Sydney uh, with the federal government and, well not federal government, but federal public service. Uh, and then I met my wife after a few months who's from Tunisia and then, uh, you know, I'm not stupid. So I, I wasn't gonna leave someone that I was so lucky to have. So I sort of been, been over here still and I'm, um, yeah, not sure sort of what the future will bring or how long I'll be here for or when I'm, when I'm going to go back to Sydney, but I really miss home. Yeah. I miss Sydney. It is nice living in Europe, but Australia is pretty amazing. So, but um, yeah, and now with uh, coronavirus, um, I have no idea when sort of any of us will be moving around or traveling or, yeah, but um, that's my background basically. Yeah, I, I can relate to that as well because, well, um, it's the other way around with me. You know, I come from Europe, uh, so I'm from the Basque Country in the north of Spain, south of France, oh. and uh, and uh, you know, I was working in London uh, for a few months, and I met an Australian, and one thing led to another, and I ended up uh, in the other side of the world away from all my family and friends. And mm. yeah, I, I've never regretted the decision I made. I'm very happy here, uh, but um, yeah, the distance, um, it, it's, it's a long distance and sometimes it, it gets hard, definitely. I get homesick. 
Yeah, it's hard. How, how often do you come back here or to Europe? I, we try to go every two years and we have done that for, um, we've done that quite consistently every couple of years or so. Um, but uh, it's now coming up to uh, about three years. So we, we were planning actually to go this year, but the way things are at the moment, yeah, it's exactly. all up in the air. So it, it's all completely up in the air. I think we're going to have to postpone it to next year. Yeah. yeah, I think so. We were lucky. We just we were in Sydney like two and a half months ago, three months ago. So we do a trip every year for, around Christmas. Yeah. So I'm glad that I sort of got that trip in before everything uh, went to hell. So before the end of the world. Before the end of the world. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, all right. So. Um, because uh, basically we're a group uh, from the library uh, association, you know, I, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, what's your relationship with your with libraries? So, you know, uh, do you often go to the library? Um, did you as a kid? Um, I, it's funny. I, I love libraries. Uh, I don't go often now that I guess I do all my study, studying and writing sort of on a laptop and in a cafe and yeah. I'm, um, I'm very sort of extroverted. Like I love people being around. So I like going to a cafe where there's people and I sort of work. I also have ADHD so I can sort of look around a little bit and focus on other things and I get back to my writing. So libraries these days are maybe a bit too peaceful for me, but I, I did grow up going to libraries a lot. I don't know if you've ever been to the state library in Sydney, but it's, no. Uh, it's wonderful. Um, my wife and I actually went there last time we were in Sydney just to walk around and there's the, I think it's the Mitchell Library. Uh, it's just, it's absolutely beautiful. But um, during high school and university, I used to go to the library like quite regularly, not really to study, just to check out girls, but um, did a little bit of study on the way. But uh, yeah, I love libraries and I think what you guys are doing is um, really important as well championing sort of graphic novels a lot of people think that they're not very intellectual or you know they're not sort of very deep or you can't learn much from them graphic novels and they're for children but I think the sort of work that I know that you're doing and some of your colleagues that I sort of see on Twitter are changing that perception and uh yeah it's great I think we need to get more graphic novels into libraries um one of my best mates is actually a, in Sydney he's a li librarian and he's always talking about graphic novels and how they put on talks and um, do their best to yep. to sort of uh, champion it. So I think things things are changing. Yeah, uh, I think uh, I think in library world there has definitely been a, a change, you know. Um, and I, I, for me, it's really interesting coming where I come from, you know, in um, in in Spain. Uh, I think graphic novels are a lot more respected than they have been for a long time. And uh, my my parents lived in France for a lot of years. And obviously in France, uh, bande dessinée are huge, absolutely huge. And they're very highly respected. Um, so my parents living in France, um, they really they really uh, liked graphic novels. They really bought a lot of them. We had lots of them at home. Uh, and so I, I grew up with a love and appreciation of, of graphic novels uh, as an art. So for me, it was really interesting um, that in the English speaking world, there was uh, from, you know, some, from certain people, there was such a stigma because uh, that, that was mm. very alien to me. So um, yeah. I'm quite happy to be doing a little bit to to kind of uh, fight those um, you know myths and um, perceptions and misunderstandings and you know mm. um, yeah good because I think I, I really think that graphic novels have a lot to offer um, and um, I, uh, I I talk about graphic novels a lot about um, you know. Uh, multiple literacies so you know they work at many different levels you know on the visual mm -hmm. aspect and the 
uh, and uh, the written and everything all together. Yeah, it's a very complex uh, text, but it, this is not about me. So <laughs> no, no, it's fine. It's just a chat. So uh, you know, I'm interested in your uh, views yeah. as well. So. Yeah. So um, anyway, uh, did you read comics as a kid? Or is this something you've done your whole life, or or did you come to comics at a later mm. time, or what's your story it's, with that? It's a bit up and down. I mean, um, uh, comics weren't huge, or well, like American kind of typical comics weren't huge when I was growing up in my area, um, in Sydney. But we were all into like in primary school, or into Tantan and Asterix and Obelix, absolutely like absolutely obsessed with them and uh even like richie rich and sort of but I, I i was never into superheroes like at all and sort of you know i'm 45 now so image and stuff weren't around when i was a teenager but um or young teens uh but then in about 2012 i got into star wars comics like the expanded universe like i'm really into star wars as you can see behind me Yep. There's a cabinet of um, vintage figures. I'm a really cool dude, comics and, and Star Wars. <laughs> so, um, and uh, so I was really into Star Wars. So I started reading the comics and then I started reading New, New 52, the DC sort of reboot. And then from there, I just started getting into Marvel and Image and everything. So it's been like eight years now. And I started collecting comics. So I go to a lot of conventions and um, even before I started writing and getting comics signed and uh, getting sketches. And uh, yeah, I have just behind me, I have look, all these long boxes uh, full of comics. So yeah, I'm I've, I'm pretty sort of addictive personality. So when I'm into something, I'm really into it and throw myself into it. But it's been like eight years now and usually I get bored after a couple of years. So I think <laughs> comics is here to stay with me. It's just such a huge universe and you just can't, you can't get bored. I mean, you, you might yeah. get sick of Marvel and you switch to DC and you get sick of that or you get, you get sick of Batman, you switch to a different character, different, different types of stories within comics. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm not, I mean, I see kind of a lot of other creative friends and they talk about how they've been writing for, even when they were a kid, they were writing comics and they always dreamt of working in comics and, and they grew up obsessing with Superman or Batman. But I, no, I wasn't, I wasn't really like that. I've always been more of a novel I read a lot of novels and, um, you know, like I've written my own novel, it's not published yet, but yeah, so I wasn't one of those typical comic book creators, I guess, with the long background. Yeah. 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 Um, yes. Uh, for me, it's, it's something that I guess I was always surrounded with and, and, uh, and I've read a bit of everything. I've always been interested in, you know, all sorts of, I love the medium and I love all sorts of different genres and I love a lot of European comics as well, which um, unfortunately a lot of them are not even translated to English. So I have to, thankfully I can read in Spanish. Um, uh, and as my parents say, you should learn French. So maybe I should learn, but, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, no, I've never really learned French. I'm the only one in my family that doesn't speak French, but I'm the okay. only one that speaks English. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm actually half French. My dad's French. So I don't know if I told you that before, but um, I've read a few graphic novels in French, but only, only a few, but they're very different to American, but they're wonderful. Yes, so. I, I, I love, I love uh, French comics and, um, um, oh, yeah, uh, you mentioned uh, when, uh, as a kid that you were obsessed with Tintin and Asterix and Obelix. Uh, uh, um, for me, um, one interesting thing is that um, most of my friends seem to be very obsessed with Tintin and I, I enjoyed them but I was mm. never really into them. Um, and that's probably, you know, quite blasphemous of me to say <laughs> for a lot of people. Uh, whereas Asterix and Obelix, I read them a million times and read them again yeah. and again and again and again, you know. And then Lucky Luke, which was written also by Gossini and uh, so many others. Eh. 
my, my favorite uh, graphic novel actually series is is actually a French series uh, called okay. um, Blueberry. Oh, okay, yeah, I know, I know that. Yeah. yeah, which is a western. So it, it's it's kind of funny. It's a French western, but um, it's awesome. It's for me, it's the best series ever put. Mm, I haven't read it, but yeah, it's pretty famous, right? I think. Uh, uh, I highly recommend it. I can't recommend okay. it now. Check it out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so it, it's cool that you mentioned also your, um, that you're a big collector uh, and, uh, and um, also a big fan of Star Wars. So uh, do, do you collect a lot of Star Wars stuff or? I, I used to collect a lot. I still have like some of my cabinet behind. That's basically just all um, vintage. So when we say vintage, it doesn't just mean old. It means for Star Wars from like 1977 until like the late 80s or around then, sometimes early 90s, depending on the country. But I collect only Luke Skywalker and only within that time period. So I have sort of packaged stuff, uh, bootleg stuff, I've got some from Spain, actually, um, French stuff, and it's so they're all different. They're all different Luke outfits. You know, they have Bespin outfit, the Hoth outfit, and then I have all the different variations of that. It's very nerdy, and looking back, I'm pretty surprised that I put so much effort into it. There's like, you know, I've got 30 loose Bespin Lukes, and they all look exactly the same. And friends come over, and they're like, they're the same figure. I'm like, no, they're variations. So they're all like a tiny variation or something. That's um, yeah. so I'm I'm pretty addictive with my collecting. I always have been like into whatever comics or even books and computer games, whatever. Um, but yeah, I've always loved Star Wars. But I I don't really collect them anymore. But I still like I'm on a um, I'm a moderator on a, on a forum called Tantive Tantive XL. And uh, so we still chat a lot. And some of those guys that are mods on that, they're some of my best friends. And we sort of meet up at conventions and we, we chat a lot. And uh, yeah, and I go to like Star Wars conventions. Even though I'm not really collecting as much anymore, I still like the social circle still really important to me. And I had a blog where I used to interview. I haven't done it for about a year, but I, where I interviewed sort of Star Wars collectors and I've still got that blog, vintagestarwarscollectors.com, but I, I haven't updated it for about a year now. It's just so hard to keep up with, uh, you know, when you're writing and doing all your own thing. And But, um, yeah, Star Wars was a hugely important part of my life. It was the first movie that I ever remember seeing um, in Sydney. They re-released the first Star Wars in 1979. And I was about five. I'd just gotten back from France. I think I could barely sort of speak English and I remember going to the movies and I think I fell asleep halfway through it, but I still remember a few moments from it and uh, yeah, it stuck with me forever. See, so, yeah. um, see with me, it's, a, it's actually a similar thing. You know, one, of the, one of the earliest movies that I remember, because uh, it's hard to say which one is the earliest, but one of the earliest movies that I remember watching at the cinema was uh, The Empire Strikes Back. And yeah. and for me, it was such, uh, you know, I it was so eye opening. It was, uh, yeah, yeah. And I've been a fan forever, you know, ever since. So I I watched The Empire Strikes Back first, and then I watched A New Hope, and then Return of the Jedi. Uh. So not not the way I recommend anyone to watch it, but uh, <laughs> that's the way I did it uh, when I was that's a little kid. And yeah, it's um, it's always it's still my favorite movie, The Empire Strikes Back, of the whole mm. saga. Which one's yeah, most yours? Cool. Yeah, uh, it's it's A New Hope, but probably only because it was the first movie I ever saw. And but Empire Strikes Back is probably the best movie with the action and the twists and everything. Um, but A New Hope really resonated with me. Um, and also, funny enough, my wife is from Tunisia, which is, you know, where A New Hope was filmed. And we went, I probably, uh, was it about seven years ago, we went down to the Lars homestead. So, you know, the little igloo 
yeah. Luke's home. Basically, we went down. It was, it's in the Sahara. It's right down south, south Tunisia, like six hour drive from Tunis, the capital. And we went down and we saw that. Um, uh, uh, we saw the set, and it was it was one of the most amazing days of my life. And my wife's parents took us down there, and they had no idea. Like they'd never watched Star Wars, they didn't care, they didn't even know what this homestead was, and I was just sort of sitting on the homestead, you know. I'm like, my God, no, this is like so important. But um, they just didn't understand why I was almost sort of pissing myself when I mm. saw this uh, igloo. But yeah, it was just just amazing. And there've been some Star Wars collectors that are actually been um, re- renovating the igloo. It uh, it uh, it fell into quite bad disrepair for a few years and they went down and they painted it and they fixed it up and yeah that's some cool Belgium and uh British collectors and, and some others so that's pretty cool so um yeah. coming back to comics a little bit but staying with Star Wars um <laughs> since uh, since Marvel relaunched uh, um you know their, their whole collection um mm-hmm. have you been keeping up with the, the Star Wars comics from Marvel I I, I did at the start, like I read sort of the first uh, 20 and I read a few sort of spin-offs and they're pretty good actually. Um, and I, I was collecting, so I don't know if you've ever seen the Marvel variant covers. So they do like a variant cover, but it's the old vintage figure. Yep. Um, so I was collect, I collected like the first 25 of those and I actually met the artist who was doing that and he's amazing and really cool guy and he sort of got them all signed. But uh. I gave up after a while. I'm I'm a bit like that. Once and one series go on, sometimes not too long, but if they go on past like 30, 40, 50, I can sometimes yeah. get a bit. Um, I just I, I want something new, and I read a lot of comics, like a lot of different comics. Yeah, so, I'm, I'm a little bit like that too. Um, you know, I don't like series that keep going and forever and forever and forever. And um, yeah. what I really liked about the new uh, series that they've done is um is uh what they've done with the Darth Vader series. I heard so, it's excellent. Yeah. So the fir- uh, so the first series that they did was 25 issues and it told mm. the story of uh Darth Vader waking up um sorry no the first one was the one they did um with with him uh between a new hope and the empire strikes back. Mm. And the second one they've done uh yeah is another series that's now finished as well and it's what happens when he wakes up uh right at the end of uh revenge of the sith you know okay. um, so uh and again it's another i can't remember the site number but it's another 20 something issues so i i like that because yeah. you know there's a story arc and it finishes uh kind that's of thing perfect. um yeah. You know, it's like, for example, I used to be r- really, really uh, huge with Spawn, Todd mm. McFarlane's Spawn, uh, but uh, I think, uh, I can't remember the exact number, but when you when it was, you know, issue 100 and something, it wasn't uh, yeah, just over 100, I, I kind of stopped. I, I don't mm. think there's any series that I've gone um, for that long, you know. So I, I tend to prefer like some limited series, even if it's 20 or 12 or, you know, whatever, but I prefer to uh, prefer that kind of thing or graphic novels as such. Mm. Yeah. I think so, yeah. a lot of people are going that way now. I, I, I read like the first 50 of Spawn and I did read all of Walking Dead. I think it's what is 170 something, but I, I read all of that. But that was over a long period of time so yeah 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 um so anyway i'm I'm sure you've been asked a million times but uh but you know um why comics what drew you to start writing comics because uh it's not like you started um young it's like suddenly you something something changed or there, there was something there that made you think, no, nah, I'm going to write a comic. So well, what's the story there? Um, yeah, I, I, I actually, funny enough, I remember the exact moment, which is kind of rare for me. But uh, so I, 
so I've written a novel and I've been writing it for like seven years, very slowly, sort of the draft's been finished for a couple of years, haven't, I haven't sort of sent it out to peer reviewers or anything yet. But um, so I've been writing when I started getting into comics sort of around 2012 and I was going to conventions and I was meeting a lot of artists and writers and chatting with them when, when they signed my comics and just getting to know a bit about the craft. And, uh, and then, so I'd already kind of had the writing bug and I was doing the, the blog and, you know, I've got a lot of sort of stories in my head that I want to get out, but I, I, I'd never thought of writing comics. And I was chatting to uh, an American comic book artist uh, in Amsterdam who was doing a signing. I've met him a couple of times already and we're, we're pretty good mates now, actually. He lives over in Europe, but, um, and he, uh, this is Steve. And uh, yeah, we we're just talking about the craft and he was explaining a bit and I sort of just asked a bit about, how artists and writers collaborate and how the scripting process works. And I just thought to myself, oh, I might give this to go. I remember I was in Henk, it's uh, a comic book shop in Amsterdam. Um, yeah, and I just thought, you know what? I love comics, I love stories, uh, I love sci-fi. Uh, I think I'm an okay writer. I've, I sort of know a few artists and sort of writers already. I've built a bit of a network already in comics just through my love for it. And I thought I'd give it a go. And, you know, I, like I kind of said before, I really get into things and I throw myself, I throw myself into things. I'm a pretty sort of intense guy. And then I just started, um, yeah, I had, had a little idea in my head and then I sort of just started working on a story and, yeah, I met an editor, my editor, Erica Schultz, at New York Comic Con in 2016. So this all happened around the middle of 2016. Yep. And then I met with her 2016 and started writing my story and it just went from there. And we finally published the first issue in 2018 and then at the whole, the entire thing last year. Yeah. So yeah, that's how I got into it. So um, about the Resurrected, uh, so th did the idea come to you fully formed or, or was it something like you just had a bit of an idea and then you had to work your way around it? How, how do you work as a writer? Because, you know, different writers do it differently. Some yeah. just have an idea and start to write it and see what happens and where the character takes them, whereas others are very structured and think about yeah. the whole story or maybe they start from the ending and then work their way to that. Yeah. What, what, what's your method with that? Yeah. yeah, I mean, everyone has, like you said, everyone has their own method. Now, right now, like I'm writing an anthology now, I have a very structured method where, you know, I, I, I get the, the idea, like a small idea, and then I write, and then I write the plot and I work out the characterization, I work out the twist, I work everything out um, just in dot points before I even start writing anything. Whereas, um, so yeah, I'm a very structured writer, but with The Resurrected, I kind of had this one idea um, we just started with people being resurrected. That's all. That's all I knew is that I wanted, I wanted resurrection uh, to be possible. And I've sort of, uh, I'm quite fascinated by um, sort of our mortality, or more so scared. I, I'd say frightened and fascinated, but um, and the fragility of sort of our lives. So I thought, okay, I want to, I want to write about resurrection. I want to write about the sort of pursuit of immortality. Uh, but I didn't really know where I was going and I just sort of started writing ideas and then I knew that I wanted to have an Aboriginal um, protagonist, not for any particular reason, not because I wanted to make a point of him being Aboriginal, just, you know, I have a lot of Aboriginal friends in Sydney. I grew up around sort of Newtown, Lee, Redfern, that, you know, there's a big, big Aboriginal population. I always thought, I don't, you know, you don't see many Aboriginals in sort of, Comic. So anyway, I, I thought, um, so I started there and then I had another idea that I wanted it to, to be set in like a United Nations city state. So basically, basically the UN has moved to New York and they've set up their own sort of island and, and state. I think working with the UN where everyone's from everywhere and everyone's sort of different colour and different religion and different culture, it just sort of seemed right to me. Mm -hmm. to make a story like that. Um, and then I had the sort of themes in my head. I started sort of working out that I wanted to write a bit about 
colonization in Australia and highlight some of the issues there. And, but then one thing that I didn't do until a bit later was I didn't work out what the controlling idea was, which is that, so basically controlling idea for people who sort of don't write and stuff is, it's not the theme, like a theme can be love or death or a controlling idea is what is your story trying to say? Like, what's the takeaway to your story? How, what do you want people, to, how do you want them to feel when they walk away from it? So for, I sort of didn't know what that was until I'd sort of written half of it and I went back through my plot and I, real, and I realized that unconsciously that I've been writing about how each character deals with death, like how do they deal with their own mortality or the deaths of other people and then how they dealt with death, that, that sort of helped to, um, to structure the kind of people that they would become or the kind of, you know, whether they're healthy individuals, whether they're sort of obsessed with uh, finding a resurrection serum and that sort of, you know, is their downfall. Yeah, um, well, I really got a strong sense of that um, when I was reading it. And actually, so I... Um, I, I write myself as well. Uh, for me, it has, yeah, it's the, the thing that I always say, it's, um, it's the thing that keeps me sane. So uh, I've always been a writer. Um, uh, I write a lot of poetry and I write a lot of short stories and they usually end up in the drawer. Um, sometimes I put them online, you know, uh, but yeah. Uh, Publishing is not really something that I've ever pursued, but um, it's what helps me and keeps me sane. And mm. and uh, reading, especially the poetry, um, um, one thing that I write about a lot is actually about death and loss, okay. you know, and and how we deal with it and 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 what it means to the people that are left behind, you know. So for me, when I was reading the graphic novel, that really resonated as well, you know. Okay. And I, I get the sense uh, from, from reading The Resurrected, I actually get the sense, and, and now obviously talking to you as well, I get the sense that uh, you're a person who's really interested in politics and social justice and philosophy and things like that. Um, am I right or? Yeah, I, I mean, I majored in, philosophy at university undergrad yep. and then I studied a lot of sort of I did a I've done a couple of masters since and part of those degrees were sort of politics and I work at the UN and um yeah social justice is uh it's funny because it's become such a malign sort of term social justice warrior yep. or SJW and it's pretty horrible to be honest that it can somehow hang it have a negative connotation but um yeah yeah social justice is very important to me especially growing up where i grew up i'm not sure if you've heard of redfern in sydney but yes. i sort of my mum lives a few minutes five minutes away from Everly street and i sort of grew up in that area and saw sort of firsthand a lot of from what what my mates um had had been going through and even now still sort of go through so yep yeah, the resurrected in the end, although I kind of said earlier, didn't start off as I didn't really plan to tackle social justice problems or social problems. Um, but in the end, it, that, that became one of the strongest sort of issues about how we, the colonization of Australia or the invasion of Australia and, and how, how we treated the indigenous population and how we to a large extent are still treating the indigenous population. So yeah, um, those issues are important to me. It's funny though, because I'm writing a new anthology. Well, it's almost sort of done and the art's halfway done, but I don't deal with almost any social issues, uh, social justice issues. I think the, the resurrected exhausted me. Um, so I think I needed a break from um, tackling those sort of issues. Uh, yeah. And I, I think I've sort of, been, I mean, I, I did a, uh, I ran a seminar recently at the Amsterdam Comic Con on writing and someone uh, did ask me, you know, like, how did, uh, um, how did you feel about writing Aboriginal characters? And, you know, did, did you, did you feel that you had the right to write them? So, um, 
yeah, it's something that sort of always sort of hung over my head a little bit, that, that weight of writing a culture that isn't mine and sort of representing one of the oppressors, I guess. So, yeah, that, that's caused a lot of, um, I wouldn't say stress maybe, but just, yeah, it's been sort of a heavy process. Well, I think it's, um, yeah, uh, it's, um, it's something that um, has been discussed a lot in the last few years, you know, and, and uh, I think it's, um, I think it's a fair question um, yeah, and, and, um, and a discussion worth having. Uh, I think the way you approached it though, and with your background, where you grew up and the way you approached it, uh, as I understand it, you did a lot of research, you did consult yeah. with, with uh, your Aboriginal friends as well and things like that. I think, you know, um, and, and also obviously what, um, what you're saying as well in the story, you know, and are you playing with stereotypes or not or, you know, and, and I thought that um, reading the graphic novel, I thought, I mean, I'm, I'm not Aboriginal obviously, you know, but uh, I thought that it was a very positive representation and, and I felt like um, it was it was genuine and it came from a genuine place, you know. Thank so. you. Yeah, that means a lot to me. Um, it, it, it's something that kind of, even after I sort of published it, I was, I've, I was always like, oh, is someone, is someone going to say, who the hell are you to sort of write this and but it, it's funny that I haven't actually had any criticism. Um, I have had a lot of criticism from white people actually. I've uh, had people when I've sort of promoted on Facebook and Twitter have said, ah, oh, this is uh, anti-white propaganda. Uh, oh, and you are, I think one guy was like, you are, are buying into white guilt. And if that works for you and sells comics and that's fine. But um, I mean, that that's not my and this is not anti-white propaganda. This is you know it's focused solely on Australia. I'm not I'm not against white people, obviously. Although you know we have a lot to answer for, but that that's not the point of it. But um yeah, so it was quite a stressful pro process. But it, like you said, I did a huge amount of research, um, but not really about not necessarily about how Aboriginal people are or their history, because it's something I was sort of a little bit aware of. Um, still not, I don't consider myself an expert or even close, I have a huge amount to learn. But more about the protocols of writing um, Aboriginal characters. And uh, there are a lot of Aboriginal writers, or I, I shouldn't say Aboriginal, Indigenous, because also Torres Strait Islander, Islander writers, uh, who sort of write about they say if you're not Aboriginal, if you're not Indigenous and you're going to write these characters, you're going to write these stories, these are the kind of protocols you should follow. For example, you know, I, I didn't talk about personal stories or any real historical sort of stories. I didn't um, also even things like dreaming stories. Um, this is one thing I didn't know that, you know, I was going to have a depiction of uh, the rainbow serpent. Uh, in one of my scenes, and I sort of did a bit of research, and you have to actually have permission from from the group that 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 own this story, and I had no idea about that, and and yeah. um, and even other sort of other depictions, and uh, so that was a lot to learn, and I made sure sort of they weren't they weren't stereotypical, and I had Aboriginal friends sort of re I had like four or five friends read through my stories, read through the script. And I even had one, one friend that I grew up with and he looked at some of the art and he was sort of at the start. I think I talked about this in another podcast where um, at the start, the sort of body paint in, in the first two pages wasn't quite indigenous yeah. looking, like Puri looking, because they, they were Puri's and he sort of explained a bit better how to do that paint. So then I spoke to the artist and he fixed it up and then he showed and then I showed my friend, he said, you know, that's perfect. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I had to, I had to make sure that I, uh, that I did it right. And I'm, I'm like, I'm still worried that maybe I didn't do it right, you know, but, but from the feedback I've had from my friends, I, I think I'm pretty, pretty safe. I know there are some people out there that say that, for example, non POC people shouldn't write POC characters at all. 
I don't agree with that, but you know, I'm not PSC, so I don't think my opinion is that that important to other people. But when I'm writing my own story, it's definitely important. And I think that just as long as you do it right, you do your research, you get you get um, sensitivity reviewers, uh, you don't assume that you know sort of everything and that you can write wherever you want. You can't. And I think one 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 Indigenous writer actually said, look, if you don't have Indigenous friends to talk to about your characters that you're writing, and if you don't know anything about Indigenous characters, maybe you shouldn't be writing Indigenous characters. Yeah. So, so, yeah, I think I was in a probably better position than a lot of um, non-Indigenous writers. Yeah. I was lucky. Yeah, in um, talking about so. these things, actually, um, um, did, did, you, uh, did you watch the ABC series uh, Redfern? Redfern Now? Is it called Redfern? Oh, I love Redfern Now. Yeah, that, yeah, that's filmed next to my mum's house, actually. Her street was in that, uh, was in that yeah. series. Yeah, it's a great series. That was a really beautiful series. I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah. And, and um, did, did you watch um, Clever Man? I did. I, I watched, I uh, actually had an uh, Aboriginal friend from school. Uh, he was one of the, the people that reviewed my script and he actually sent me that, that series because I'm living over here and I, I don't really keep up with Australian. I, I, like I don't have access and I didn't know about it. So I'd kind of plotted a lot of my story already and then I, I watched Clever Man. I'm like, oh, this is like a very similar genre. It's um, it's like indigenous characters set in the future, in a dystopian future, and there's a lot about sort of um, a lot of things about colonization and racism. And I was kind of like, oh, it's very similar. But I thought to myself, you know what? There's a, there's a million similar stories about white people. I mean, why is there only allowed what one indigenous sort of story about? Just dope, like you know, racism and colonization. So I kind of yeah, but it's um, it, it's a wonderful series. It's really good, and uh, yeah, I actually reached out to um, it's called Blackfella Films, I think, uh, who produced that and Redford now, and I actually sent them an email and asked if they knew anyone that could um, sort of help me with finding some more reviewers of my story and trying to find sort of Aboriginal artists and stuff. But uh, they wrote back, they were really nice, but they said, look, we, we're sort of overwhelmed with sort of our current work and we, we can't really help. But they gave me some links where I can, um, where I, can I think it was like the Aboriginal Department of, oh, it was Aboriginal Affairs, but it was another department. And so they gave me some handy links and they were really nice actually. But um, yeah, I actually tried, like, Sorry. I was pretty. Uh, I was pretty sad when they um, they didn't continue the series, you know, because I, I I really enjoyed what they. Uh, the oh, episodes so it's not, that they not coming out. No. Oh, uh, okay. I've been googling it, but I I didn't see a definitive sort of answer. Oh, that's App a shame. I, I, I thought apparently it was not. Sorry to break it to you. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but but yeah, apparently they they're not going to continue the series, which is really unfortunate. Um, it is. I thought they really did a great job as well. It was so it was so well done, and yeah, it was, I mean the story, like I admire the writer of that. I wish I could write that well, mm. yeah, but um, oh that's a shame because I know they did a comic. I I read the comic. Yeah. Uh, they did like a first issue. Um, yes. And, and I was, uh, they, it looks like they uh, they will um, finish publishing that storyline. Uh, when oh, okay. that's going to happen, I'm not sure. Um, um, uh, but uh, I think one of the creators um, uh, uh, I can't remember exactly. Uh, uh, but one of the creators either he was really really sick or or had oh, an accident good. or something. There, there's been some health issue. Uh, but um, it looks like they um, they're looking into finishing that storyline at least. So oh, excellent. Hopefully, hopefully that will happen because uh, again, yeah. I oh, did sure. buy the first issue as well. <laughs> yeah, me too. On Comicsology, I read it. And, yeah. Uh, oh, that's a shame. Yeah. And, um, so um, just, coming sorry. back to you and your comics. Uh, so you said uh, you're working on an anthology. I am, and I haven't. Uh, talked about it publicly at all yet, but uh, it's an so exclusive. 
It's exclusive. Um, <laughs> and it is, I've only been writing it since sort of December. It's only been a few months, but it's basically all, almost all written, like 95%. Um, it, it's a short, there's a, so far there's about six stories, but I'm probably aiming at about eight. Uh, they range from like three pages to 20 pages, and they're all kind of very dark, bit twisted stories that sort of explore, explore our minds a little bit. Um, and a few stories are already, uh, the art's already finished and sort of all the lettering and they're sort of done, but I'm, I was planning in a couple of months to probably start pushing it and maybe, I mean, it'll be completely funded already and all finished, but Kickstarter is such a great platform for actually selling comics. Not, it's not really about sort of, uh, necessarily funding it's just like it's, it's a, for indie people like it's yeah. difficult to get on diamond and you lose a lot of money and it's, it's hard to get into shops and even for me to send stuff sort of all around to shops if you're not on diamond it's very expensive so um kickstarter is a great uh, a great platform but uh yeah i was going to say but now with corona i'm like i don't really want to be promoting and pushing sort of my story and publishing even because shops are closing down or you know like temporarily yeah. even and so i'm kind of going to push it off a bit but it's uh it's still happening it's really exciting um uh yeah i like i'm writing i've written one story with my wife which has been probably my favorite ever sort of experience um yeah it's a short story about anxiety uh and and yeah it's some of the artists we have involved so far are Matthew Dow Smith, uh, Ariella Cristantino is going to write it, is going to draw a story. Um, uh, J. Paul Sheik, I can't pronounce his name, is writing uh, is drawing story. Renee Rientes, who's a Dutch artist, who I'm good friends with, she's drawing story. Who else? Uh, Man House um, as well, and we've got amazing colorists are working with us as well. Uh, Erica Schultz is, is editing everything and Cardinal Ray would do all, all the lettering. So I don't know how many pages will be, maybe 50, 60 pages. And we're gonna get Tula Lotte, we'll do the cover again. She, she did the resurrected uh, trade cover yep. and she's hands down probably my favorite artist. So to work with her, it's just amazing. I mean, like, I'm not just a comic book writer, I'm a collector and, and, and a fan. Yeah. So for me, it's, all of this is amazing to sort of collaborate with these people. I can't believe it, you know? Yeah, so yeah, it's going, it's going well. And hopefully I can, um, hopefully it's not too long that I can actually start sort of releasing the stories. Yeah, so um, um, I was going to talk about that as well. So um, obviously you um, you got the resurrected out through Kickstarter, and so it sounds like you're going to be doing the same with this anthology. Uh, what did you learn from the first Kickstarter uh, that you know that you can apply to this one, and you know maybe you can recommend to others as well. Because I, 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 I'm increasingly seeing more and more comics, independent comics, um, going through mm. Kickstarter. Yeah, Kickstarter is is like I said before about five times. It's amazing. Um, so I don't see it as a really as a funding thing because, for example, the Resurrected was was done. Like I, I actually kickstarted the first issue, but it was complete when I kickstarted, and then I kickstarted the the entire trade paperback, but all the, all of the art was finished. So I'm sort of of the mind that you should have a completed product before you kickstart it. So you just say you're kickstarting the print run or whatever. And because firstly, I don't want people to wait six months for their sort of comic book to arrive. And I want to make sure that uh, I sort of built their trust. That like, you know, I've already got this comic, it's happening. Don't worry, you know, you're not going to lose your money. And you know, I've, I've kickstarted projects where two years later, I'm still waiting. And I'm, I'm not so bothered by it, to be honest, but I just don't think it looks very good to sort of, um, to not deal, to not deal with your promises very quickly. But, uh, so what, what I learned actually doing probably from the first to the second was the first one, 
it's basically your friends and family that will be the majority of your backers or at least the majority of the funds that come in. I'm incredibly generous and I didn't have a lot of, not, I wouldn't say not a lot, but I didn't have, the majority weren't sort of these fans who were like, oh, The Resurrected, this sounds amazing. Oh, Christian Carnouche, I love his writing. I mean, it was, it was my first comic, so people didn't know me. So it was really my friends and family that gave me that sort of boost and that initial sort of foundation to build on. And then with the second Kickstarter I did a year later, um, I was really lucky I made like probably 5,000 on each, on each Kickstarter, but that, I mean, that's still a very small portion of what it costs um, yeah. to do a five issue series and to print it. And so I printed with Print Ninja, which is a really good printer in China. Um, anyway, and so what I did learn was that my friends and family, they weren't always gonna go with a second issue. Like a lot did, but it was a huge drop. Uh, but what, what, what I did gain was I, I gained a lot of um, repeat backers and, and a lot of new fans, which was really, I don't like saying fans, but like a lot of new readers, which, which sort of made me feel really good that the more that I write, I'm gonna sort of expand my readership and gave me a bit of sort of um, belief in myself uh, and in the artists I was working with. And um, so that was great. So, so I kind of, for anyone doing their first Kickstarter, what I would recommend is to push it to your friends and family, you know, like I bet all you guys sort of, support your friends and family so don't feel bad if you're sort of asking for a bit of support to to get a leg up um you know it won't happen for every kickstarter you do but the first one really push it i uh what i didn't do with the first one that i should have done was uh, an email list where you build an email list and then you can sort of update people and the links a lot of people aren't on facebook they aren't on twitter and they might not see your updates might not come up in their feed, but with their email, with an email, they'll definitely get it. So I actually had a lot of success with a second Kickstarter with my email list. Um, the majority of my funds probably came from that. And I had like producer tiers where you could, uh, it was a few hundred euros and you could be named as a producer and you got a sketch or you, or you, or you were drawn as a character yeah. into the, into the comics. So I had a lot of success uh, with my email list with that tier. Yeah. Uh, what else? Um, oh, definitely uh, one issue that I had was, maybe not with Kickstarter, but just with doing your own comic was I printed with uh, Print Ninja and they're awesome and they're, they're a bit more expensive than other printers, but they are at the same quality as sort of DC and Marvel. But what I didn't realize when I did my trade paperback, I mean, it's, it, firstly, it's incredibly heavy. So shipping everything into the EU from China was crazy expensive. And then what I didn't think of, because I'm not the smartest guy in the world, was uh, customs charges. I mean, I paid 1,500 euros in custom charges alone. Oh, and when, wow. you're doing an indie, when you're doing an indie uh, project, yeah. that's just, you know, um, almost defeated the project, uh, the purpose. But I, I think in Australia, you probably don't have the same issues, but, but, but in the EU, it's, yeah. yeah, I'm not doing that again. So, and I also, I paid a uh, fulfillment center in China. This was, this was good in one side, but what was good, it was not good on the other side was, so basically all of the comics shipped from the printer in China to this fulfillment center, and then they shipped everything off, off for me all around the world. So I didn't have to do it myself. And also the shipping fees, were um, were a lot cheaper, so I could charge cheaper shipping. Because, for example, if I ship something from here to Australia, you pay twenty euros for the trade, but then it's going to cost you, you know, over ten euros to ship it. So I didn't want people to have to sort of pay through the nose for that. So it was a lot cheaper using the fulfillment center, but they also took a lot longer, and I had to ship some stuff to them. They had to get other comics shipped to them. There was a lot to deal with. Yeah. And so next time I do a Kickstarter, I'm just gonna do it on myself. Shipping will be a bit more expensive. Um, but I think if you just do it yourself, or just, it, it's a lot more work, but um, yeah. And plus I trust myself, like with the first, the first issue, they sort of hadn't packed some of the comics properly and some of them got damaged in a post and I had to replace them. And, yeah. But if I do it on myself, I, you know, you can, mm. I guess I can trust myself. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, I, I suppose the main thing with Kickstarter, I think a lot of, it's hard 
especially for people like me, I, I don't like to sort of ask for things and I don't like to talk myself up and, but you've just got to push, you've got to push, push it. You know, you've got to promote yourself. You've got to talk to all your friends and family. You've got to be on Facebook. You've got to be on Twitter or Instagram. I mean, it's really difficult, especially if you're trying to minimalize your digital footprint, but it's, uh, yeah, you've got to, you, you've got to put yourself out there and you might fail, but you can pick yourself up and you do it again. And, you know, Mm. And I'm sure you succeed at some point. Yeah. But, uh, so uh, have yeah. you have you um, have you tried? I'm putting you on the spot here completely. <laughs> but uh, have you have you tried or thought of approaching some um, publisher? I, I have. I I actually had a. This is one thing that a lot of people assume that when you self-publish that that you didn't get any offers. Um, I, I did actually get an offer to publish, uh, I won't say who they were. Um, they weren't a huge company, but, but they were big enough and they were gonna print everything, um, distribute everything, uh, but they wanted half of my rights, yeah. and which is common with, with, with a lot of publishers. Um, and they were gonna pitch, they were gonna pitch the concept to, to film studios as well. So I think this is a, a lot of what, um, some publishers, they sort of pick up comics and they think that maybe it'll become a movie and that's where they can make some money, which is fair enough, you know, it's, it's a business. Yeah. But uh, I just sort of thought to myself in the end, like, what can they really do that I can't do myself? I mean, I can print it myself, I can promote it, I can, I can distribute it. Um, but I, I wouldn't say I regret it, but there's something inside me that says, ah, oh, would it be nice to just have a publisher print all the trades and get them into shops. Cause this is one, I think we've talked about this before. This is one thing that I haven't done enough is because it's so expensive to, to ship to shops and they don't pay the shipping, um, that it's almost, it defeats the purpose to, to sort of send the copy to, to a shop. You know, if I send, I mean, I have sent some copies like to shops, but it's been more about wanting to get people to read the issue than it is to make, uh, sorry, to read the comic than it is to make money. So yeah. I kind of lose money when I ship to shops. But every time I go away and I, like I travel a lot, I always go into a comic store and I sort of say, hey, um, you know, I wrote this comic, would you like to, to stock it? And actually I've had a lot of success with that. So that's sort of um, been pretty cool. But uh, yeah, yeah, so, uh, but, but I did, I did pitch to Image and, uh, because the the artists in my project, they've all they've all sort of worked for um, mainstream companies, so I'm the only one that was unknown. Yeah. So I sort of thought we'd have some good success, but it is. It it. It. I mean, as we were sort of talked about earlier, it tackles some pretty pretty heavy issues, and that might have yeah. turned some some publishers off. You know, it's it's very, uh, sort of, anti colonialism and it's it's you know a lot of people they when they tackle these issues of racism and colonization they're very sort of subtle with it but i've sort of said before that i used a sledgehammer i was like boom 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 these are the problems and you know we should be ashamed of ourselves and uh because i was just shocked that and i'm off on another tangent now adhd yes that's fine so shocked. <laughs> sorry working at the UN and I, so many people had no idea what was going on in Australia. Everyone's like, ah, oh, it's a paradise. Ah, oh, this is fine. I'm like, yeah, it's a paradise for people that sort of look like me, but it's not a paradise for everybody. Mm. And, um, and yes, yeah, so I really wanted to ram that issue home. And a lot of people that reviewed it, I was lucky actually to have this reviewed like probably about 50, uh, 50 times by sort of websites and blogs and stuff. And, Quite a few people were like they had no idea what the situation was like in Australia. Yeah. So yeah, to go back to that point, yeah, I, I um maybe it was a bit heavy for some companies, but I, I thought a company like Black Mask might might have liked it, but yeah, they they didn't get back to me. Um, yeah. but that was a, that was a few years ago now. That was three years ago, and I only had one issue done, and you know, yeah. I'm probably I now I've done a lot of conventions, and it's you know I have a pretty good good sort of readership now this sold pretty well actually for a first comic and now I'm doing a second one so I've got a lot more hope for the second one maybe pitching it 
Although I mean, it's an anthology, so I don't know how easy it is to uh, get anthologies published by companies. Yeah. But yeah. So yeah. I did try, and I did get an offer, and yeah. Yeah. Well, it's um, it's a big dilemma for artists. Uh, you know, um, how do I do this? Do I do it myself? You know, there. Yeah. Um, uh, as a teenager, I used to listen to a lot of punk music and, you know, the bands that I respected a lot were the bands that kind of, they did it themselves, you know, uh, yeah. and, and, um, uh, you know, or do you go with a, with a big company that, you know, will take care of all the distribution and all that, but, you know, they, they, yes, mm. they do take a huge, massive cut um, mm. of it. And, uh, and sometimes they, you know, yeah yeah it's a big dilemma definitely for artists yeah nice. so um uh well so i guess uh we'll look forward to your anthology does it have a title yet or not no it doesn't no. have a title but um i'll probably i'll probably start promoting it in about a about a month and maybe releasing some pages and yeah i can think of something something then so where should we check your Twitter or your blog or? Um, God, I don't even know what my Twitter Twitter name is. But, but if you search, um, if you search <laughs> under my name, Christian Kanush, uh, on Twitter there, and then the website, which I haven't updated for a while, is kanushproductions.com. Facebook page is Kanush Productions. Uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram, it's like either my name or the company, but I'm mainly, I update sort of all those platforms mainly, but um, Twitter's recently what I spend most of my time on. Yep. That's why I'm losing my mind. Yes, and, um, me too. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so um, Twitter, I think. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Uh, but w I'll probably put um, your social media and your website in the notes for this video as well. So. Um, and, and I was going to say, yeah. just a bit of a surprise, that what I'm going to do is a, bit, a little giveaway. Uh, I don't know if you can really see them, but so yeah. I'm going to, I'll sort of announce it. One, once you post this video, on it, it'll be like trade paperback, uh, Arella Christantina's cover, a variant, the first issue, and then some prints and some stickers. But I'll, um, I'll give that away. Uh, to one of the listeners, but I'll sort of announce that once you um, once you publish the video. Oh, that's awesome! So, that's no worries. And I'll post it anywhere. I, if you're in Australia, I posted something recently to Alaska, another competition I ran. So it doesn't Alaska. matter where you are. Alaska, yeah. So, wow, that was the first. All right. So uh, thank you, Christian. It's been an absolute pleasure to. Uh, <laughs> First time in that we talk face to face, and yeah, uh, an absolute so. pleasure. So yeah, keep up the good work. And same to you guys. I mean, thanks personally for your support, but also for Alia and you guys are kicking goals and doing great things. So yeah, and I'm looking forward to reading some, uh, to watching some of the other other chats you have with other people. So yeah, uh, well, we have a few uh, uh, creators lined up and a um, couple of librarians and an um, educator as well. So yeah, hopefully we have awesome. some interesting content coming up. Awesome, thanks Here. so much. Take care. See ya, bye.